Kumi, thanks so much for joining us on the Weekend Briefing. So good to see you. Yeah. So do you think you have the most stressful hosting <laughs> job in television? God, I love the whole, let's just jump right yeah. in there. Uh, no, I don't. Do like, you think I do? Yeah, I've, I've hosted a similar show to Insight where you have, you've got about 15, 20 people in the studio. You need to know all of their stories. You're covering the most complicated and potentially cancelable topics like <laughs> transgender sport or, or racism or all these different topics. You've got to have all their stories in the back of your mind so you can weave them together into something cohesive and watchable, um, all as though it's live. You know, that Now I'm stressful. feeling stressed when you describe <laughs> it. I'm like, yeah, that sounds stressful. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I can see where you're coming from. I think I am blessed because I imagine my job like a iceberg mm -hmm. where I'm the little tip up the top and there's this unbelievable strength underneath the show, the team that makes what unfolds in the studio possible. So by the time we get guests into the room, they've been spoken to a number of times over six weeks. Mm -hmm. They've got this kind of air of trust in what we do. So when they're in the room and I have to kind of curate this show, they're sort of already invested and on board. They know there's going to be no gotcha moments. They know there's going to be no surprises. We're not going to ask them questions that they don't want to answer. So I know that I've got this kind of, um, I guess it's like a canvas of colours that I sort of know how it's probably going to unfold. Mm. Having said that, how it actually unfolds in the studio is a different thing. And so in terms of stress, I suppose I feel more, the stress for me is the responsibility to the people in that room and the responsibility to my team who have spent months putting a show together. I feel that's actually my biggest stress. In the early days of the show, I think I felt much more stressful about how people would react in the room, if they cried, if they got upset, I felt like I needed to fix everything mm. really quickly. That's now what you I, want, don't you? That's what I want. I'm <laughs> like, oh my God, I'm sorry. Are you okay? Do you want to keep going? But now I've learned that that's actually just part of the process. I've become much more confident with that. So mm. I actually don't feel too stressed. I feel when I walk into that room, all I think is I want to do these people's stories justice. I hope they feel safe. I hope they share in the way that we want them to because that's kind of what's going to make, make the show sing. And I hope that I can be a sort of strong core for the conversations to happen around me. And I hope I do everyone justice. That's the, the biggest stress for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like, you know, the Australian Jerry Springer, but you're being responsible <laughs> with people's lives. That's Is that right. a fair way to describe it? But I often sit in meetings and go, can we just go a little bit more Jerry Springer with this one? <laughs> Well, it's been around almost 30 years. It is an Australian institution and it's kind of, it feels lucky almost that it's survived. It is an old school kind of format to actually bring all these people together to debate, argue, almost fight sometimes, but often find some sort of cohesive narrative. Um, and in an age of social media where there's so much criticism and anger and polarization, is it a bit of a miracle that it still exists? I honestly think it is. I think any broadcast TV show that still exists is a miracle in <laughs> itself. But I think it is a miracle and um, one that we keep coming up with topics every week. But two, that it survives. But actually, I think the strength of that, you mentioned that polarisation in social media, there aren't any real kind of cohesive, respectful debates mm. happening over... The other thing that's really interesting is you can put together a documentary about people who have differing views and then you, you know, put this person there and that person there and you interview them out of sequence and then you mm. build a narrative. And so you can build a really interesting, say, documentary around a topic that's fascinating because you're presenting all different points of view. But it's one, that's one thing, but it's another thing to have all those people in a room live together. Facing off. Facing off yeah. because... It, we can all be very brave with our opinions and what we think when we're not having to sit yeah. next to or opposite someone who thinks differently to us. And I just feel like it's a lesson in that it can be done. Mm. And so we actually have a lot of younger viewers who are at school who say they don't actually care what the topic is of insight. They just like seeing people disagree 
or have different opinions and in be person. able in person yeah, and it right. not actually be a shit show. Because the town square sort of has been obliterated by social media and that's this, this sort of, yeah, notional town square, this idea that we, we come together in one community and meet with people who are different to us and discuss ideas and, you know, we have this sort of um, economy of ideas where people can trade them off and see which one comes out better and that hopefully helps us create a better society. But social media has put a bit of a handbrake on that. Oh, massively so. And the other thing although, too... Although, sorry, it, just, it, it promised to do it, but then actually sort of almost did the opposite. Right. And I feel like even before anything's discussed or even if you wanted to raise a kind of general discussion on social media, everyone's already fired up <laughs> before they've even opened the app, you know, it's kind of like, okay, what can I criticize about this now? Mm. Because that's sort of the, the narrative now. But the other thing we've found, which I find fascinating too, is, you know, we're living in an age where, yes, we're so connected, but we feel disconnected from ourselves and from others and all that kind of stuff. Loneliness is huge. Mental health issues are huge. We've also brought people into that room who have shared an incredibly awful experience in life, like losing children murder, um, total injustice, and you bring people into a room who feel lonely, like they're the only ones, we're the only people who have experienced this horrific thing in our mm. life. And there's been episodes where we've brought those people in from all over the world. And there's an incredible, I don't want to say healing, that sounds a bit mm. sort of tr no. trite, but there is an incredible thing about shared humanity where we can all sort of be vulnerable and say, this awful thing happened to us. We never want it to happen to anyone else. We will come on and talk about it. And then what we find afterwards is there will be people who share that space together, who keep in touch with each other mm. in perpetuity, who still email each other, who... I, I feel like that's probably one of the things that I love so much about the show is not only the discussions that can happen between people who disagree, but kind of the the shared compassion for what it's like to be human. Connection. And that's yeah. what media can offer when it's being healthy and, yes. and doing a good job and connecting people. And that's that's why I loved radio, you know, a kid growing up in country New South Wales, hearing about these other worlds and ideas and stuff I might not hear about, you know, in my small town, it connected me to a bigger world of ideas, imagination and stories. And then when I became a radio host and was, you know, given the, the privilege of sharing everyone else's stories on radio, I could hear in their voices often that they hadn't told the story before. And as they were telling it, knowing that the whole nation was listening, they were feeling connected and that they weren't alone. And then other people would react and share their stories. And you get this sort of moment of connection and coming together and, and people realizing that what they've been through, you know, it just, it wasn't them alone and they were part of something bigger. And that need to share, I find so fascinating that someone would call you, tell a story that they've never yeah told before it's so vulnerable yeah. you're putting yourself in such a vulnerable situation and I'm sure we'd all be healthier inside if we felt more comfortable with sharing maybe not on national radio not on national radio yeah. yeah I mean and that's the thing I always think got these people who often who come into our studio are so brave and willing to be vulnerable I admire that because I don't think I could I don't think I could be a guest myself <laughs> So you were actually faced with this. You took the cameras to possibly one of the most challenging personal moments in your life and you froze and you wanted to stop. <laughs> so that was in Japan. Yes. It was uh, about two years after your father died. Very heavy personal family story um, where I guess what you're talking about there was put to the test. Can I share my most mm. vulnerable moment? with the cameras and for a second there you thought, no. So we'll come back to that, but yeah. let's, let's wind back the clock. You had a Japanese father, a white Australian mother. Um, so you were a half Japanese girl growing up in Australia and your parents split up at five. You moved to Sydney, but you end up living in regional Australia. Yes. Tell us about that childhood. <laughs> Um, it's funny because I didn't even sort of realize, I mean, I knew I was half Japanese, but I didn't sort of realize how different I was. I'm doing those inverted commas mm. until I, um, 
went to stay with a friend. I was about 11 or 12 living in the country and they had breakfast and they had this thing called muesli. Hmm. <laughs> And they kind of put milk on it. And so I, bland, and I it? remember eating it and actually felt sick. I think there was something to do with the milk or maybe I've got that Asian milk thing because I'd eaten like miso soup and rice for breakfast with a cracked egg over the top mm. and maybe an apple or something. So my normal, even though I grew up with my white Aussie mum, as you said, was very Japanesey because she speaks Japanese. She's she has a business with Japanese stuff. So all my Japanese cultural understanding came from her, even some of the language. So my normal was um, very, I guess, abnormal, you know, sort of sat on the ground to eat food. We had Japanese food every night. Mm. We had sort of those Japanese curtains, those noren, those ones in our doorways. Um, and so it just hit me as, as all of us really, when we hit adolescence, that there's always something we feel other or different, right? Mm. For me, it was probably that, um, a small countryish town, um, Southern Highlands, Mitterland. Southern Highlands, Which town? Uh, Mittagong. Okay, nice. Yeah. It was very pretty. Yeah, it's beautiful Don't there. go back there often, but it was nice at the time. <laughs> it's only an hour and a half away, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> You've done yeah, Mittagong. Yeah, done Mitt I've done yeah. Mittagong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so look, that was my that was my growing up. Look, I always had great friends. I always did really well at school. I was very engaged with everything. I was mm. very sporty. I played the violin. I did everything really. I was quite academic, but there was always a sense of feeling on the outer. Mm. We all have it though. I in feel like we yeah, all have reasons. it in Absolutely. different reasons. So it's not a victimy thing at all. But for me, my sense of outer was definitely. Geez, I wish I was blonde hair, blue eyed. That right. was just my wish, right. my absolute wish in Why? the world. Ah, oh, that's a great question. I felt like I would be normal. You know, I felt like I'd be attractive to, in my case, men. I felt like I would um, somehow be able to succeed in the world in a more effortless way. Which is true. Which is true. Mm. Yeah, which is 100% true. And there was just a distinct feeling that if that one thing was different about me, then life would be effortless. Isn't it funny? Because maybe a, a blonde, blonde haired, blue eyed kid in that town who was maybe living effortlessly in some ways also had one thing about them that you didn't even know about that, that made them feel like they didn't fit in. 100%. Yeah. Absolutely, without a doubt. And actually, a really good friend of mine when I was in my early 20s, I was sort of having a whinge about something and making my ethnicity sort of part of the problem why life was hard. And I'll never forget we're standing at a crossing in Sydney and we're pressing that little pedestrian button. And he said, have you ever wondered whether it's other stuff about you that people don't like? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> yeah. And it was quite Insightful, but ouch. confronting at yeah. the time. I've got to say it hurt. But I had to sort of admit, yeah, he had a point, you know. I can't sort of just blame this feeling mm. and this ethnicity stuff on my life being difficult. Mm. So he actually gave me a good reality check. That's strong stuff. Good strong friend. Strong stuff. Good friend. Good okay. Friend. What I'm hearing here is that all of these thoughts and, and differences that you're having to navigate as a child and then a teenager growing up in the Southern Highlands in New South Wales, trying to fit in, does really serve you well to be a journalist. And then this particular job that you're doing now at Insight um, since 2021, um, where does the story go from, from here? How did your relationship with your dad sort of evolve given you were living a separate life from him in country New South Wales and he was on his own in Melbourne? Yeah. So, um, in a nutshell, I disconnected from him when I was about 12. I decided I didn't want to see him anymore. Reconnected with him when I was in my early twenties. Wow. Yeah. And that's an extraordinary story. So I was, I just decided in my mind, I'm going to go and see him again to shut the door forever. That was my decision. I don't want to know about him. I don't want anything to do with him. Um, I sort of heard from him once every few years. We might exchange a, you know, card here or there. So I went, I was living in Perth at the time, drove across the Nullarbor, went to visit him in Melbourne, literally to shut the door to go, yep, all the things I hate about him are true. Hmm. Don't ever want to see him again. Before I left Perth, I had this computer and this is how old I am. The internet was just really sort of kicking off. You could download these images hmm. and put them on your desktop um, 
as a background, you know, a desktop background. This was a big deal back then. And I was obsessed with space. I've always been obsessed with space. And um, NASA had just released this bunch of amazing images from the Hubble telescope. And I learned somewhere that you could go onto their website and you could download an image and put it on your computer. So when I left Perth, I thought, oh, I'm going to download an image. So when I switch on my computer on the east side, it'll be there. It's kind of this image that'll be from one coast to the other. I strolled through all these photos and I found one of the Horsehead Nebula, which I loved. Downloaded it, shut off the computer, packed it up, drove across Nullarbor, knock on the door to see my dad. Awkward small talk. And he says, uh, Kumi, in his very sort of broken English, he said, Kumi, I want to show you my new computer. I went, oh, okay, cool, whatever. Hmm. Sort of rolling my eyes internally. Mm. Here's a bit of show and tell. Um, Not the emotional sort of connection you were No emotional for. connection. No, oh, my God, Dad, it's been ages. It was very pragmatic. Walk into the room, switches on his computer. He loved tech stuff, so he wanted to show me his tech stuff. Switches on the computer, up pops on his desktop, the exact image of the Horsehead Nebula that I had downloaded in Perth like two weeks before right? from the same website, trawling through the same hundreds of images. He had chosen exactly the same image. And I remember thinking, God damn it, this moment that was meant to be closing the door just cannot be that way. I can't let this go. No. Like I am of the same person. Like he is, it was this sense of he is my father, not as in a father figure, but genetically this is where I've come from. So from there, it was a very much a, oh, this person really is who I am. He was a journalist. He was curious about the world, very interested in people. That could be true, but you could still walk away. Why? Because mm. he reflects you. Did you change course and decide to stay connected to Gosh, him? Gosh, you, you, you ask such interesting questions. Because I felt probably deeply lost in who I was as a person and on a deep fundamental cellular kind of level, it's very hard to explain. And so when I saw that image and saw my dad, I thought there was a missing piece of the puzzle that I could understand where I'd come from. I was quite different to my mum and my sister. My interests were quite different, how I felt about the world. And it was it was kind of like unlocking a little bit of a, an answer mm. in a way. Um, so he held the, the keys to a lock that you'd been struggling to work out. Yes. Or you felt that way. Definitely. Definitely. And it wasn't and never was a sort of, oh, let's go and be a father daughter and go on a little coffee date and, you know, talk about our feelings. It would, I knew it would never be that kind of relationship, but I guess that journalistic curiosity, I kind of thought, oh, you know, okay, I came from him. Where did he come from? I feel very much that, that his genes in me are very much stronger than the other ones. I can just feel it in my body. So then it was sort of 10-ish years of slowly reconnecting. Um, I spent a lot of time in Melbourne in my, oh gosh, it would have been early 40s, working there for the ABC and so I could go and visit him a lot more. I became much more curious about his background and how he survived the war and what he was interested in as a journalist. Um, he loved sport. I love sport. So it was just that sense of, I guess, the more I understood him, the more I understood myself. Mm. So it was kind of a, not selfish, but a curious relationship on that level took him out for coffees. You know, he'd never been to a cafe before. And I told him about cappuccinos and he's this old. Despite living in Melbourne for decades. For decades. Yeah. He'd go and play golf and make his little thermos of tea. He never bought coffee in cafes or anything like that. Um, yeah. So I feel very happy to have, I was very sad when he died. Um, and it took me a couple of years to process that because I think there was a part of me that I lost, you know, a part of, part of my ability to learn more about myself died obviously when he died. So mm. yeah, that's, I guess the, the trajectory. Yeah. Okay. And so he passed away about seven years ago. Yeah. I'm trying to think now, maybe five or six, something like that. Yeah. I can't remember. So he 
died about six years ago. And throughout those years, like him, you'd become a journalist. You'd worked around the world. You spent about six years in Hong Kong. You'd also traveled into the Middle East. Uh, you'd come back to work for the ABC. You know, survive various different parts of this crazy career. <laughs> yes. Um, and then after he passes, you decide to go back to Japan. There was m more you wanted to learn. You obviously learned a lot since reconnecting in your 20s about yourself. But his family story obviously still had some massive question marks that you wanted to solve. And it does bring you back to this moment we yes. discussed where you took the cameras with you, which seemed like a good idea. But all of a sudden, when you were there, about to turn them on yourself and probably your family. I'm like, I'm out of here. No, bad idea. Bad, bad idea. idea. Yeah. It bothered me that no one in Japan knew that he had died. Wow. No one knew? No. Completely so he had, he had had such a, in Japan, it's very funny. Like he was the second son, um, first son, you know, takes over the business, looks after the family. When he decided to move to Australia, it was like, okay, you're on your own. It's a very Japanese thing. You're on your own. So he only went back to Japan three times in 40 something years. So after about a year after he died, I thought, no one knows he's dead. It bothers me that people can die and no one knows. It just does my head in, does my heart in. I hate it. Um, so I just thought, yep, go back, tell the family he's died, do a little bit of a Kumi discovers her past sort of thing for the ABC. I didn't love the idea at first, but I got on board with it. I thought, yeah, I can do this. About halfway through filming, I was on a Shinkansen, the bullet train from um, Tokyo down to Osaka. And I thought, I just had this moment of, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. I was so upset in the um, train. I was talking to my producer and I was like, I, my story's not for sale. I don't want to do this. I don't want everyone knowing this. I feel like I'm intruding on my own life and my family's life and I was just weeping and I said, I want to get on the train home. I want to get on a first plane home. I don't want to do this anymore. And she just let me basically download for about 20 minutes. And then she said, look, I've done this for many years and there's often a point where this happens, where you just feel really vulnerable and you feel really exposed and you just, the whole thing didn't feel right. And then I sat there and I thought, I started sort of, going through in my mind how many people I've interviewed over the years. It could be on anything from tax reform to I've been in jail for 10 years to I lost my kids. Um, how many times I've called people up and kind of needed them. If, if you and I don't have people sharing their stories, we don't have an industry, right? Mm. Ultimately. Yep. Um, how many people I'd asked to share and sort of how I've really benefited from that really. And I just remember thinking, oh my God, if, if I'm not willing to do what I ask of others, then what, what kind of, it just, I just felt so hypocritical. Yeah. I felt like I have to do this because I ask this of other people. And in a sense, it's probably been the best thing because when I'm now in that room with what I do at SBS, I know what it's like to sit there. Mm. And I know that feeling, it's not only sitting there for the record in their case, in my case, it was in Japan when the cameras are on, but it's also the waiting until that thing goes to air. How are they going to edit it? What am I going to look like? The what, messages you'll get from family. Yeah. The messages from the family, conversations. other people, other strangers deciding what they think about you. The lack of control. Lack of control. And that was the other thing I realized was, um, for my documentary at least, I would see the final edit before it went to air. I could potentially say, hey, I really don't like that bit there. Can we take that out? Everyone else, as you know, doesn't get a say. Um, so it's probably been the best thing to do really. Um, yeah, we ask a lot of people yeah, and, and I feel a great responsibility to their stories beyond that time we ask of them as well. So we ask a lot of people in the moment. We ask a lot of people when that goes to air. Mm. We ask a lot of people, you know, I'm really curious about how they are six months on, a year on, because for a lot of people it's the first time they've shared that story or the first time their family will hear something, the first time their kids might hear something. 
So it, it will inevitably have a ripple effect in yeah. their life. Well, we started by talking about the show and how it sits within the social media context and how different they are and how distrusting social media can be and how angry and polarizing. I guess that's what, yeah, it's all, all changing, isn't it? The context yeah. where we can connect and communicate and we're in a state of flux, you know. You and I have grown up through all the various different um media revolutions of the last 20, 30 years, you know, remember hearing about MySpace for the first time (laughs) and then each platform became the new thing. And it was, I always saw it as a really positive thing um, Mm -hmm. that we could have this connection, you know, often, you know, having moved cities or towns or having friends around the world or being separate from family. My, my most beautiful dreams were always about all of my friends from different parts of my life coming together and playing in a, like a, childlike backyard kind of setting hanging out together you know that was my dream of having everyone together and in a way social media almost promised that but then sort of mid 2010s heading into kind of you know the brexit trump sort of culture wars going to another level it all sort of changed um and now here we are i gotta say after the pandemic years it feels like it's calmed down a little bit. Mm, I feel. I feel like it has too, and it, it it will always be with us. So it's not like we can get rid of it. Because um, you've sort of stepped back from it, haven't I, you? I have. I have for a number of reasons. Just I don't know. I just one. I don't even know what to put on there. Yeah. I don't. We've really. shared everything, haven't yeah. we? I think the pandemic kind of brought Instagram to a bit of an end, where we'd all shared a lot. It was about sharing. I think TikTok is more about talking and and ideas Mm. but Instagram really was about visually sharing our lives and then by the time we're all stuck in a similar looking lounge room with a bookshelf and a TV and a, a door and a window, it was like, I've got to say, I've got literally, my life is so boring. There's actually nothing to or share. Or you have ki- and kids. And you know, I, I'm a, this is my little theory of, I actually like a bit of mystery. Like I don't like knowing everything about everybody mm. sometimes. And so I really, um, I like keeping certain parts of my life mine mm. and there's a bit of ownership over that um and I like being more considered so in my job now you know a lot of people say to me you know how do you keep up with what's going on in the world and the news and this and that actually like, if I spent a lot of time on social media whatever platform I actually couldn't do my job well which is really interesting because coming from 24-hour news for so long and day-to-day news stuff as you know we have to be on the ball about everything and then at 10 a.m this happened then midday this happened mm. and then 2 p.m this happened and then the p.m it's stepped noise up a lot of it's, it's noise noise yeah. and when you're in it you feel like it's incredibly important to know exactly what's going on all the time i watch the news once a day Mm. and just see, oh, what happened? Well, it's back to the old school. It's like the news at the end of the night. It's like if if it's not worth knowing by the end of the day, it probably wasn't worth knowing. There's more context. (laughs) I scan headlines. And in a sense, what we do is so different. We never really follow the news cycle. We follow what I always say, what's in the zeitgeist. I say, what? what's everyone sort of feeling? What's, Mm. What's going on out there but on that broader level? How do we how do we tap into where people are at in their lives right now, which is important in terms of speaking to your audience? And then the news events they create the data points for that. They deeper, create the data points, and issue. and yeah. I find that if I'm too caught up in one issue or another, because I kind of go down a rabbit hole, my brain's not in a good space to really feel what our audience needs and what we need to produce as a show. Mm. It's not that sort of bigger picture. Oh, I wonder whether. How are people feeling about having kids these days? Yeah. No, it's the deeper underlying themes. And then, yeah, instead of getting confused by this or that happened at a certain time of day, which is just kind of in a in a statistical sense noise, rather than finding the deeper trends and looking at how those data points might illustrate what's going exactly. on at a deeper level, it's much more high quality information. It is. And, and in a sense, you're then finding people which is the difficult thing and the fascinating thing. You're not finding someone to talk to that as an academic or an expert. We have experts in the room, but you're finding your everyday normal people about how they feel about something. Um, And if that has been their life experience, which is just, to me, is just extraordinary because you're getting everyday people sharing their everyday stories and, in a sense, that becomes the realness. So yes, the data points are there, the stats are there, 
Um, but yeah, that's literally mm. just sort of bits of flicks here and there just to, to contextualize what we're talking about. Um, and the fact that it's been going for so long makes me feel like we will always have, it's extra, like if you looked through the breadth of even the shows I've done the last three years, a lot of them are similar. Mm. You know, we could talk about relationships in 10 different ways. We can talk about um, an issue in 10 different ways. We often revisit issues because two or three da years down the line, you can look at it from a slightly different angle. Um, you can bring in different data points. So we're con like you and I, if we had this conversation three years ago, would be very, very different conversation, mm. right? You and I have changed mm. in three years. Yep. The world's changed around us. What we want has changed. What we need has changed. So inevitably a show like ours will keep going in a sense forever because nothing's ever static. Mm. How we feel about our place in the world, what, what traumas we've gone through in the last few years. Today I'm healthy. I'm talking to you. Tomorrow I might get hit by a bus. You know, you just don't know where life will go. Well, you know, we've been doing it since we were sitting around the campfire at the end of a day of hunting and gathering is sharing our stories and trying to connect. So it will go on in some format. Thankfully, this format that you're hosting <laughs> still exists in it. Yeah. The more we talk about it, I mean, we're doing a good sell here, but the more we, <laughs> the more we talk about, it, I'm like, it's important that this, um, last semblance of a town square that's respectful still exists. Yeah. And you know, my, my big dream in life is to have a little cafe, to run a little coffee shop. And I always, um, You'd go be a good back host. to, You'd be a good host. thank you so much. Yeah. I do love coffee or a little coffee cart, like in a little kind of Greece okay. town or something. But I always think of those French coffee houses, those Parisian coffee houses in the 1800s. And people used to go to these coffee houses, engineer, a writer, a financier, everyone from all walks of life would go there to share a problem. They'd say, look, I'm trying to figure out how to screw this bolt here. or I'm trying to figure out how to write this. So I'm trying to figure out why it is that rain falls a certain way. It do doesn't really matter. And what they found was ideas sort of flourished in that time because you were speaking to people about something you were trying to solve emotionally, academically, but but asking the opinion of people who weren't in the same sort of cross-discipline yes. pollination. Yes. Thank you for getting the <laughs> words for me. And I love that idea. I love that idea that, you know, we can get into our bubbles in terms of our work, our jobs. We can all do that. But I love this idea of a town hall where we are welcoming different points of view because, in fact, that's what makes us innovative and mm. creative and connected yep. and think of new ideas we cannot create out of our little bubbles. And that's probably my biggest sort of fear about social media stuff is that we don't find it exciting to be challenged by different ideas. I, I love it. I love, I love it when there's a guest in the room who on paper I've thought, oh, I'm not so sure mm. if I actually sat down with that person, would I really agree with X, Y, or Z. And I inevitably come out the end of a record going, God, that person was fascinating. Gosh, I learned a lot. Gosh, I challenged a little bit of my own biases, even just those little kind of sneaky ones in mm. the back of your mind that you don't even realize you have. I love that. I love this idea that perhaps there will be a Parisian coffee house idea out there. Just wheel the coffee card into the insight studio <laughs> and you're pretty much there. I thought about it. <laughs> Um, so we've hit the story a few points about going back to Japan and reconnecting with your dad's family. Give us the final act of that story. What happened when you did get the cameras rolling and you, you went to tell them that their son or their brother so I, had yeah, passed away? I went to tell my oldest cousin that his uncle had died because I knew that my cousin would have been living probably in the family home. I wish I could say it was this amazing reunion of like sort of, oh my gosh, our family's reunited. I went and found him, filmed, discreetly filmed behind the front door. I didn't want the cameras to hear about, I didn't want them to hear me telling them that news. I feel like mm. it's very private. Okay. My Japanese isn't great. His English was kind of non-existent. So the communication was very difficult, but I came away, uh, I wouldn't even say disappointed. 
how I thought it would go, as in I told them the news, there was kind of a, I think there was a, a curiosity and a generosity that this person had come from Australia and she was this, I, I last met my cousin when I was probably about seven. Mm. So it had been a long time, but it's never going to be one of those, hey, let's email each other and send each other photos of our families. But it felt a, like a good thing to do. I felt happy that my dad, it makes me just emotional thinking about it, that my dad was known in that sense, that he, his daughter went to Japan to tell his family that he had died. And I guess it's a very Japanesey thing that they'll process that in their own way. In a sense, they'd already said goodbye to him decades before. Mm. Um, so that relationship with family was, was slim at best for him, but there won't be sort of family reunions. It's not going to be, Hey, when's your birthday? If I go back and see them again, um, it will just be very polite cup of tea, but I feel like that's enough for me. Were they welcoming? Very, right. very welcoming. Um, walked into the house, had some tea. I printed off a bunch of photos for them and put them in a little album and sort of, um, where dad had lived and, um, photos of me and photos of us together. My dad and I, very few photos I have of my dad and I together. Um, I think they really loved it. And funnily enough, the, the, the person who was the most excited was, I guess it's my first cousin once removed, my cousin's daughter. She's about wow. 13 and she was, uh, can you imagine for her, this is like random person rocking up from Australia. Other side of the world. Yeah. And it's very monocultural there, right? There's not, very yeah. monocultural. I mean, we were, you know, unusual to be half Aussie. Mm. Our Japanese grandparents loved us, but it was very radical really for this kind of little half Asian kids to be running around. Which is way cooler when you're 13 as opposed to <laughs> maybe the, the grandparents. Yeah. So word, when you, you spoke to the first cousin and then you obviously spoke to other family members were you confident that the word got to as many of the remaining relatives as it as I it just spoke to him um so he would have told I guess his his dad had long died um he would have told maybe his cousins mm. um but that was it and there's no one else really to tell it's really strange no one else really to tell and I wouldn't have even known who his friends were so it's a funny thing, you know, the, the idea of people dying and no one known has always bothered me. I, I have a real heart for homeless people. I just can't stand it. I just think no one wakes up in the morning and goes, geez, today I'd love to be sitting on the street and begging for food and, you know, everyone walking past me and not looking me in the eye. Like no one makes that choice. Mm. You get there by ever all manner of ways. And it does sadden me that, you know, people just die and no one knows. It's just extraordinary. Like I often think, what what choices do you make in your life to get you to the point where no one knows that you've died? Oh, that's heavy. Yeah. And so I'm just glad that dad, um, yeah, dad was sort of known in that area. And, and a lot of people in that area knew him, the little guys in the coffee shop, like, oh, I remember your grandfather. Oh, okay. And there was sort of the, the gossip of the town. They knew everything about my family. And um, it was hilarious sort of gossiping about my family in the coffee shop. Hmm. And yeah. What a bizarre so situation. It's a bizarre thing. situation. There's a tiny little street in Tokyo, which looks like it's back from, I don't know, the 70s, people riding bikes. And strangely enough there where my name Taguchi, which is hard to pronounce, um, very different in Australia. My surname there carries a, a weight. There's a legacy to it there. My grandfather had the hardware store. You know, my dad was known, my uncles were known. And so when I wander into a little coffee shop there and say, oh, my, you know, my grandparents were here and I'm Taguchi, Taguchi Kumi-sama, there's a kind of, oh, and they'll bring out little phone books and show me the phone number of my house. And mm. it's quite lovely. It's mm. quite lovely to have, um, it's quite lovely to have a legacy somewhere. Absolutely. And it goes back to what we were saying earlier about when you're asking people to tell their stories and being sensitive as to whether they, they do want to share, but then realizing that everyone wants to matter. Yes. 
everyone wants to matter. And I think everyone at, at certain points in our lives, we just want to be listened to. Mm. You know, we don't, we don't want, we don't need reassurance. We don't need advice. We just need to be heard and say, this is my truth and this is how it made me feel. The end. It's quite simple, actually. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. And it's, it's what happens on your show and why it's such a great privilege to host it. And it's been great to... <laughs> You're doing such a big plug, Tom. We, well, You're woven, very kind. We've woven the two together, I think, in a really nice way of you as an individual stepping up to share your story in the context of this job you do that curates everyone else to do exactly the same thing. Um, I mean, I do say that to producers. Um, if people are ever hesitant in coming on and you can never force someone to tell their story. So we're quite, we never really chase people much. We just go, that's your choice. That's your choice. But there have been a few people who have been worried. Um, two kinds of people, people who have been done over by the media before, mm -hmm. don't want to go there again. And someone who's worried about sharing their story and how it makes them feel. And so we actually often send that documentary to them. And mm -hmm. I say to the producers, look, if you want to share with them that, mm. I know exactly what it's like and I nearly pulled out. Good to have it in the back pocket. It's, a, it's in the back pocket as a final card. Let's get them over the line. Awesome. Well, great to speak to you, Kimmy. You Thanks too, so much Tom. for coming on and being so open and sharing your story here on the Weekend Briefing. My pleasure. Sweet. Great. Awesome. Good chat. Great chat. <laughs>